What is up, YouTube? I'm Devon DaVinci, leader of the Renaissance Crew, and you are watching DaVinci Reacts. Today I have an episode for you guys. This is the 10 Deadliest Armies of All Time. This video was recorded by All Time Top 10s, or All Time 10s. Um, yeah, it's just All Time 10s. I will have a link for the channel at the end of this video. The last 30 seconds or so, it'll pop up right around here. And there is a link for the original video in the description box down below. If you haven't seen this video already, I highly encourage you to watch it. Uh, first, if you don't feel like watching it two times in a row, um, you can watch this video, but before you start the video, right click on the original link, open it in a new window, click play, put it on mute, let it play in the background or something so that the video is still getting a view because that's the only real way you can show the original content creator support. That's how they make money off ad revenue and things like that. You playing in the background is probably going to help them out the most, um, like I said, especially if you don't want to watch it twice. But it's really up to you. I encourage you to watch it, the original, before you watch a reaction. But if you have already seen it, then welcome. I'm going to go ahead and start this and let's see what this has to offer. I think Army Men should be the number one on this list because they're completely undefeated. Except for when it comes to like firecrackers and shit. But. Ten deadliest armies in history. Army Black men. Number ten, the Roman legions. The Roman Empire started in, well, Rome, obviously. But what began as one city-sized civilization eventually spread out to cover most of Western Europe, Asia, and North Africa. And you can't amass an empire that covers a fifth of the globe without an army able to bulldoze any opposition. At its peak, the Roman army reached around 450,000 troops. But, size aside, these soldiers were the best equipped and trained at the time. Soldiers signed up for 25 years, meaning the military had plenty of time to turn them into crack fighters. And the Romans offered full citizenship to anyone who served in the military, helping them to keep recruitment high in the colonies and cleverly assimilating the local population with their own. A standard Roman legionary would be trained to use a throwing spear, sword and shield to slice and batter their way through opposing forces. As a group, they also trained in shared tactical maneuvers, like the infamous tortoise shell, which protected them from arrows, yeah. a tactic still used to this day. They and I think they also had a strategy where they would do the tortoise shell thing, but they would take their spears and like po poke them out so that they were like facing all directions, and then they would just like charge the enemy. It's an it's a interesting strategy because it protects them against arrows, and um, in order for you to like do any real damage, you'd have to get in close with a sword or something, and. I guess you could always use some type of artillery weapons. I'm sure they had those back in the day, but they probably weren't as accurate or as easy to fire as like what we have now. So at the time, with a strategy like that, it was almost cheating. <laughs> the Roman Empire needed to be nerfed. Tactics and numbers helped the Roman Empire become easily the predominant military of the era. Number nine, Grand Armée. Grand Napoleon Army. was clearly a tactical oh. genius. But no matter how smart, one angry little Frenchman couldn't have conquered mainland Europe on his own. It's lucky then that he had the undying devotion of France's Grande Armée. Did you have to put so much detail into that horse's butthole like that? Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh man, that, that, that was surprising. A military that the man himself built to dominate the West. Following his coronation in 1804, Lil Nap started amassing a huge army for a planned invasion of Britain. Now, that invasion never happened, but the Grande Armée did start campaigning across Europe and winning major battles. With Napoleon's tactical genius, the army won surprising victories in Ulm and at the Battle of Austerlitz, defeating the much larger Russo-Austrian army. These victories established France as the major power on mainland Europe and encouraged more and more people to join Napoleon's forces. At its peak, Napoleon's army had as many as one million troops and conquered land across Europe and into Egypt. Mm. But the leadership that created this great army was also its downfall. In 1812, Napoleon decided to try and invade Russia, a disastrous decision that led to the deaths of nearly half a million of his French troops. Number eight. Never invade Russia during the winter. You will always regret it. No matter what type of army you have, no matter how sophisticated and advanced it is, you will get your ass whooped by that Siberian front. Do do not try it. <laughs> like, I'm surprised people haven't learned this by now. Led <laughs> to the deaths of nearly half a million of his French troops. Number eight, the Red Army. And speaking of the impossibility of invading Russia, let's talk about the other famous failure to topple that cold corner of Europe, 
Hitler's Operation Barbarossa. The German forces fell apart in World War II for many reasons. But the USSR's Red Army deserves a huge portion of the credit for toppling old Stash Boy. Yeah. Unlike some of the other armies on this list, the Red Army wasn't especially well equipped or cunningly but led. Numbers. In fact, Stalin made several terrible strategic decisions towards the start of the war. And the army was so under-equipped that rumors quickly spread that the soldiers were forced to share one rifle per two men. Yeah. However, I believe it was like if somebody in front of you die, you just pick up their gun and keep going. Like that's that when when it comes down to like that's your strategy for supplying the army, that that's not a great strategy. You're going in expecting a huge number of casualties. That rumors quickly spread that the soldiers were forced to share one rifle per two men. However, this army had one thing no one could match, size. Russia started the war with only 4 million soldiers, but after the Germans oh. invaded, a further 29 million were conscripted. Essentially, the Soviets threw so many people at the enemy that they were just overwhelmed. Yeah. The German invasion failed, and the USSR marched its millions of troops into Germany, turning the tide of the war once and for all. Number 7. The Mongol Hordes Genghis, or Genghis Khan if you're really picky, really, really liked killing. Oh, Over his 21-year reign, Genghis wiped out 40 million people off the face of the earth. At the time, that was 10% of the population. In fact, Genghis killed so many people that some historians at the Carnegie Institution worked out that he's technically one of the greatest environmentalists of all time. And of course, he... Fucking environmental terrorists? Are you, is that is that our solution to helping the environment? Just wiping people out? <laughs> like, population control. Um, like I said, environmental terrorism. I guess technically if you want to do that, then fine. I guess you would also be supporting the goddamn vegan cause by just wiping out all carnivores. So, yeah, that, that, that makes you a vegan advocate. Kind of stupid ass. <laughs> Couldn't have done all of this killing without his loyal Mongolian hordes. Khan's forces became renowned for their immense speed and endurance. As accomplished horsemen, able to ride and shoot bows simultaneously, shoot they could easily outmaneuver enemy forces and overcome them. At first, this tactic allowed the Mongols to beat enemy armies far larger than their own. But after all their successes, pretty soon there were no armies larger than their own. The Mongols became the first military in history to reach one million members. And the fighting didn't stop. Genghis and his cavalry conquered the entirety of Eurasia. And they likely would have swept through the whole of Europe too, had they not been forced to turn their forces around for reasons that historians are still unsure about to this day. That's interesting. I might have to look that up. Like, I don't know a lot about um, the Mongolian army as far as like their military advances and battles and things like that. Uh, all I know is just like the territory they took over, which was freaking huge at the time. Um, I still don't quite understand why they didn't invade Europe. I'm guessing because there was a lot of um, possible enemies with advanced weaponry. So it's like Europe would just come together and fight against this Mongolian invasion. So it was probably easier to take people out in the middle of Eurasia because they weren't as unified. And even if they were, there weren't really a lot of them. Um, the only thing I really know about the Mongolians is... Uh, nobody knows to this day where Genghis Khan is buried because his army and his uh, people went out of their way to try to make sure that they masked like where he was buried at. Matter of fact, I've even heard that they killed the people that actually buried him because that way they would not like the secret of where he was buried would be dead forever. Number six the East India Trading Company. Now, my homeland may now be a ridiculous- Stop one real quick, real quick. The East Indian Trading Company is an interesting story. Like, I've already told you guys I'm a huge fan of Final Fantasy VII. And in Final Fantasy VII, there's a, uh, a, a corporation called Shinra that pretty much runs damn near the world. And they have their own army, they have their own nation, and at the end of the day, they're still a corporation. So, this is probably the closest we've ever had as in as far as the real world to a Shinra. <laughs> the Eastern Indian uh, Trading Company was like they had their own military. They had their own uh, territories that they had taken over. Like it, it's crazy. Number six, 
the East India Trading Company. Now, my homeland may now be a ridiculous little island led by a racist sheepdog that speaks Latin, but there was a time when Britain commanded the largest empire in the history of mankind. Yeah. In fact, it was such a large empire that the nation handed over responsibility of running parts of it to a private company with a private army the East India Trading Company. The company's army was mostly made up of local Indian volunteers with British officers. Although Indians were actually- It's funny because they say that like out of the three or 400 plus people that died, or not died, the three or 400 nations or something in, in the United Nations, they said Britain is like, invaded like 80% of them. <laughs> so it's like you have all these nations that come together and like Britain is just sitting there awkward like, I invaded you, I invaded you, I invaded you. Sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. <laughs> ...made up of local Indian volunteers with British officers. Oh, Although wow. Indians were actually later allowed to serve as officers too. At its peak, the army amassed 357,000 troops, twice Only the size of the 000. actual British army. That, Originally meant to take care army. of trade in the Indian Ocean, this corporation basically started to govern the entire region themselves. The company essentially ruled over <laughs> India for over 100 years. Yeah. Eventually, the East India Company got so powerful, the British government had to pass legislation to limit their power. But for decades, a private company essentially had the best army in the world. Still, at least we learned the lesson and now never give giant money-grubbing corporations too much power. Number five, <laughs> That's the funny. Thessalians. Like that. Alexander like that of Macedon would not be known as Alexander the Great if it weren't for the the Great. Thessalians. The famous generals started off with a relatively small army. What's more, ancient Greece always struggled to create effective cavalries because the ground is too mountainous and rocky to raise large numbers of horses. But then, Alexander conquered the city-state of Thessaly. And with it, he took the command of the city's impressive horse-based army. The rest is history. Well, technically, the whole thing is history. Well, actually, technically, yeah. it's ancient history. Actually, just forget I said that. With his new cavalry, Great Ali was able to pose real threats to the rest of the world's empires. You see, the speed at which they could sweep through enemy forces allowed them to route entire armies, leaving the panicked opposition soldiers scampering around like a one-legged cat in a sandbox. The Thessalians were the only unit to fight in every major battle of Alexander's conquest of Persia, and quickly developed a reputation as one of the most fearsome forces on Earth. Now, between uh, Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great, the... first of all, the territory they took over was huge. Probably the biggest in any type of campaign in world history. I, I want to know what exactly was their strategies for beating armies. I'm pretty sure he didn't just like throw people at them until they eventually fell like Russian, uh, the Russians did. And I don't know if they actually uh, named like a number as to like how many people were in their army. So I'm going to imagine it was, um, well, I don't know who came first between Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan. I, for, it's just not there. I have to look it up. But um, they said Genghis Khan was the first to reach a million, so it's possible if he was before that, if Alexander was before that, he didn't have a million soldiers. So I'm wondering if it was more of a special T army. I, I really want to know what the strategy was for why they were able to take over so fast because Alexander the Great died when he was like 30 or something, wasn't it? Like he was, he was really young when he died, so he didn't have a lot of time to take. Like the the time that he was here, the all the land he took showed that. He was just like pretty much just traveling. Like there was there wasn't a lot of staying in one spot for too long. So I want to know what his strategy was for like getting like sweeping over other armies. Persia and quickly developed a reputation as one of the most fearsome forces on earth. Number four, the Genoese crossbowmen. Winning wars means adapting to new weapons and technologies as soon as possible. I mean, there's a reason you don't see soldiers wandering around Afghanistan with a holbert and full suit of armor. And as old tech as it may seem now, the crossbow was once a cutting edge weapon that changed the face of war in Middle Ages Europe. Yeah. The Genoese crossbowmen were the first military corps to train seriously with the crossbow. A mercenary army from Genoa, they fought whoever paid them. And they often turned the tide of a battle for the team they joined. I think that was a bit of a typo. They fought for whoever paid them. It'd be kind of weird for them to fight whoever paid them. Like, here you go, uh, go take out that person. Oh shit, I just gave you cash. Why did you shoot me? They fought whoever paid them, <laughs> and they often turned the tide of a battle for the team they joined. 
On one memorable occasion, they joined the weaker Lombard League against the most powerful military of the time, the Holy Roman Empire. But they so decisively defeated the Holy Romans that a furious pope declared that from now on, his army was to chop the fingers off any captured crossbowmen. Still, the Genoese remained a much respected and feared army for decades after. They only ceased to be effective when they were replaced by another technological revolution. The invention of gunpowder. Yeah. Yep, no matter how good you are, a man with a gun wins every time. Number three, the Carolians. Sweden is not a nation most famous for its military might, but in between its creation in the 12th century and its modern day existence as a giant production company for gritty murder box sets, this nation found the time to build a kick-ass army. I'm talking specifically about the Swedish army under King Charles VI in the 17th and 18th centuries. The Carolians weren't just named after King Charles, they also fought to Fennel for him. Armed with bayonets, pikes and rapiers, this army was also trained specifically to always attack the enemy line rather than defend their own position. This aggressive and risky form of warfare yeah. often allowed them to surprise and panic armies far larger than their own. For instance, when Russia tried to invade Sweden, the Carolians defeated them in the famous Battle of Narva, even though the Russian army was four times their size. Eventually, this aggression was their downfall though, as King Charles VI yeah, made the mistake of trying it to invade Russia with them. Something we've established by now is a pretty terrible idea. Number two, the Spartans. Yeah, but it's another ancient army. And not just because the person who wrote this script spent three years getting a classics degree and wants to pretend it wasn't a waste of money. <laughs> Sparta dedicated its entire civilization to building the best military possible. Hell, disabled babies were literally yeeted off the top of a mountain shortly after birth to ensure that all citizens were full-bodied and capable soldiers. All male Spartan oh, citizens were trained to be soldiers from the age of seven in an education system called the Agoge. From then until adulthood, these boys will be trained in all the skills an ancient warrior needed, like weapons handling and living in the wild. They were also actively encouraged to sleep together to increase trust between the ranks. The Spartans took that same dedication to the battlefield, where they would fight to the death, no matter the odds. For instance, at the famous Battle of Thermopylae, you know, the one in 300. When warned that the enemy had enough archers to black out the sun with their arrows, the Spartan general simply shrugged and replied, then we'll fight them in the shade. Uh. I'll be damned if I fight somebody with swords and bows and arrows with nothing on. That 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 seems extremely uncomfortable. But yeah, Spartans, yeah, I, I can believe the whole sleeping together thing because from what I've read, weren't they like pedophiles pretty much? Like they slept with uh, small boys and it, it's it's a, a very dark period in history. And yeah, it, Great warriors, not great people. Arrows, the Spartan general simply shrugged and replied, then we'll fight them in the shade. Number one, the US military. Oh. When it comes to impressive armies, there's really no army now or in history that could stand with the United States. Now, it's not the biggest force in the world, although it still has a whopping 1.4 million members across advanced. its various branches. But the US government throws more money at its military than the next seven highest spending nations combined. In fact, US military spending is about half the entire world's military spending. Because it's not like you need any money left over for things like healthcare, education, infrastructure, <laughs> social security, or literally any program that nice, nice, isn't yeah. paying for the most effective yeah, way that. to blow someone up in a desert. The result of this spending glut is a large and incredibly well-equipped army with the latest in every conceivable military technology. From a million dollar drones to trillion dollar jets that aren't even needed, America has the resources to defeat any other nation. Some experts even claim that in a conventional invasion, the combined forces of every country on Earth would still lose to the US of A. And that's enough for America's military to cruise to the top spot here. So that was the 10 deadliest armies in history. Which one do you think was the most badass, if that's even the right word to use? Let us know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, check out the next one, which is on screen now. Yeah, um, great video. Um, I liked all the entries and things like that. Some of them I have to look more into. Like I said, I want to know what the uh, army of Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan, what their actual tactics were. Like, why were they able to steamroll over other armies so well? Especially when I don't think they had, like, more advanced... Uh, technology. It's not like they were using guns against swords or something. So there's something they were doing that was just flat out destroying people. And as far as the United States military is concerned, 
Um, yes, our spending is extremely high. But there have been nations that have competed with us as far as spending. Like during the Cold War, I know the Russians were competing with us as far as uh, military spending. It's just that they didn't have a lot of like they used a lot bigger of a percentage of their um, like national treasury towards their military as opposed to United States, even though we're spending like upwards to seven hundred million dollars a year or seven hundred billion, seven hundred billion dollars a year on um, our military. It's still only like five percent of our national uh reserves so we still have a lot of other cash the thing is that is money that could be better spent in other areas normally when a nation spends the amount of money we're spending it's because they're currently in like at war and i'm sure we have conflicts but there's no reason why we should still be having them at this point we should be focusing on improving life inside the nation and you know, cutting down on our, our budget. They were right when they said we need to uh, invest more in our educational system and our health care and things like that because it's it's funny because right now, well, I'm just going to go ahead and get political. If you don't want to see me get political, then go ahead and click off the video. The video is over for you as far as right now. Um, it's funny because there's a lot of people going around throwing out this like red scare thing where it's like oh everything is communism and this person is a communist or a socialist and this person is a communist and a socialist this policy is a communist socialist policy and right now with the coronavirus they're currently uh trying to pass some type of legislation that would stimulate the economy by giving workers money and everybody that was talking about socialism and communism and this that and the other they have nothing to say about this uh, cash out that the government wants to give. So it's like, <laughs> like they'll sit there and talk about socialism and communism when it's money going towards something that doesn't directly benefit them. But when it's something that they can gain from, then it's like, oh, just give it to me. I don't, I don't care. And they like, it's it's just it's funny and like the upper the upper class the people that are like rich and the ceos and the lobbyists and things like that they did a they've done a really good job in america as far as tricking people into thinking that the government helping is some type of welfare or is some type of handicap and you only you're only good if you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and everybody has to um do their own part and you can only get into it what you or you're going to get out of it what you put into it and things like that and people that take government uh assistance is um like leeches that are draining the economy and they're lazy and this that and the other but these are the same people that go to washington and beg for bailouts and beg for stimulus packages and beg for um, ways of helping them get out of financial crisis and stuff like that. And like even now, like I believe it was like a, a couple weeks ago, the United States government dumped over $2 trillion into the stock market. But you didn't hear anything about socialism or communism or anything like that when it came to that because... This is how it's always been as far as tax cuts and things like that. Like they always do stuff that help a certain uh, type of uh, or a certain group of people. And if the people in the lower class ask for something like that, it's considered a handicap. And like I said, this whole mindset is something that's been pushed through by people that already have money, people that already own companies and things like that they'll sit there and tell you that that stuff is considered uh, handouts but then they'll go around and try to lobby con uh, congress to give them handouts and it's like open your eyes look and see what they're doing they're telling you one thing while they're out doing another thing they're taking advantage of you like they're telling you that 
this is what's helping you while at the same time going out of their way to fuck you and just open your eyes, look at it, and you will see exactly what's going on. The fact that the lower class uh, income has been stagnant while the upper class has been constantly growing and growing and growing and growing. We've just been stagnant and in some cases even going down. It's like there's a, a rift being developed and it just it's going to keep doing it until the everyday person gets up and realizes what's going on and wants to make a change so everything is uh well i was about to say everything is objective but there are some subject subjective things out there but there are objective facts and there are there are objective falsehoods and some things are just objective facts and these are objective facts we're being taken advantage of and it's not going to change until we do something about it we got to the same people that will tell you about government handout these government uh assistance is handouts and things like that are the same people that will say stuff like pull yourself up by your bootstraps and things like that well now it's time that we actually do pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we hold the government accountable we got to stop assuming that somebody else is going to come in and help our situation like somebody else is going to come in and think about us and go oh well you know we should help these people because they haven't they they it just hasn't happened decade after decade this has been going on and they just take more advantage of you and like even now the stimulus package that they just proposed a couple days ago with the republicans it was primarily going to help out corporations and ceos and why is it that they tried to put in some type of policy that kept like that hot that hit the the benefactors of the the bailout for six months. Like, why would you hide that unless you're intentionally doing something nefarious? There should be no reason why you're trying to hide who gets the the money. And it's like they they're still doing it, even in the middle of a crisis. They're trying to take advantage, and it's like either two things are going to happen: either eventually the average American person is going to get up, wake up, and realize what's going on, and try to make a change, or the economy is going to just get fucked because it's not like the people in charge have already shown that they don't care about the outcome of like the economy and stuff like that. They're still doing it, even though the economy is showing signs of a possible recession and things like that. They're still doing it. So it's like as long as they get money, they don't care. And really, it's up to us to make a difference. So. Go out there and vote. The best thing I can tell you to do is actually learn about uh, politicians. Don't worry about the, the bullshit they say on campaign trails and when they're running for Congress or president or local uh, uh, a local political position or whatever it is. They'll tell you what you want to hear when they're campaigning. Go into their history and look up what they have done in the past. If they don't show any signs of caring about the average uh, person's interest, don't get swayed because they're running for office and now all of a sudden they're trying to change and say, oh, well, we, I care about what the average person wants. You have shown no evidence of that whatsoever. Like Mike Bloomberg was running for president. His entire history goes against everything he was campaigning for. And you expect us to believe that you're just you just changed overnight. Here, here's a little hint. When someone is 70 plus years old, they're not going to change overnight. Chances are whatever they believe, they probably still believe. You don't just change that. You, you don't have an epiphany at 70 and all of a sudden your worldview has changed. That's usually not how it works. So look at someone's history, see what they've done and vote for them based on that. Don't vote for them based on what they're telling you now. And there are plenty of places where you can actually go and look up uh, facts about politicians um, I believe the one that matter of fact let me go and try to I'm not going to pull it up but I want to try to see if I can uh, find the name of it oh yeah the, the, the site I go to to look up the history of um, politicians is called vote smart it should be vote smart dot org I think yeah vote smart dot org um, go there type in a politician's name and it'll come up with if the politician was willing to share this information, if they weren't willing to share it, that's also a red flag. 
Um, it'll come up with any type of uh, positions they hold, what they believe uh, in regards to those positions. It'll come up with their voting history if they happen to be in, uh, like if they happen to have a history in Congress, it'll uh, come up with what they voted for, what they voted against. It'll have a list of uh, financial donors that have donated to their campaigns. So you'll know who is funding them. That's another thing. Don't vote for somebody that claims they want to help with uh, health care and things like that if they accept money from pharmaceutical companies and things like that. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. Don't vote for it. Um, look up the history, things like that. I've gone on long enough. I gave you my political opinions. You're free to give your political opinions as well. Just know that this is the Internet. If somebody has a problem with what you have to say, they will go to your comment and, you know, have a debate with you. If you're not willing to have a debate, if you're one of those people that if you like present your argument and then somebody else presents something else. And the first thing you have to say is, oh, you're just a bot or something stupid like that. Then don't even give your opinion because it's obvious you don't care about having a discussion. And that's one of the things I hate most about social media and stuff like that. Like people just assuming that because you have a difference of opinion you're you don't exist or something stupid like that but whatever uh go ahead and leave the comment about whatever you feel uh, i look forward to seeing what you guys have to say i am devon da vinci hopefully you've been a little more enlightened i look forward to seeing you guys in the future i'm gonna give you the deuces and i'm signing out deuces <laughs>